Super thing. So in three, two. Good evening. This is Chairwoman Julie Hen. I now call to order the Board of Education of Baltimore County's work session on the superintendent's proposed FY 2023 operating budget for Tuesday, February 1st, 2022. I invite you to recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag to be led by Mrs. Kathleen Causey. We will then have a moment of silence in recognition of those who have served education in Baltimore County. Mrs. Causey. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Tonight's Board of Education meeting is being held virtually and broadcast online through Microsoft Teams. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this evening will be done by roll call vote. Per the motion to post postpone this agenda item from the January 25th, 2022 meeting, Tonight's meeting is scheduled as the work session on the superintendent's proposed FY 2023 operating budget. And for that, I call on Dr. Williams and Mr. Saris. Good evening, gentlemen. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. I will be calling on Dr. Yarborough Mr. Sayers, thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Chairwoman Hen, Vice Chair Pasteur, and members of the Board of Education. I'm pleased to open the fiscal year 2023 operating budget first work session. The FY 2023 proposed budget is closely aligned to the BCPS strategic plan, the COMPASS, our pathway to excellence. Significant proposals are geared towards our goal of raising the bar, closing gaps, and preparing for our future. Next slide, please. The proposed budget focuses on two key areas for our school system, people and progress. It is centered on our core purpose of increasing achievement for all students and a variety of pathways to prepare students for college and careers. The development of the operating budget is a multi-step process that began this fall with program and director level reviews, followed by chief review and presentation to the superintendent and executive leadership. This process also includes gathering input from principals through a budget priority survey and superintendent review in preparation for decisions, recommendation, and presentation. The next steps include public comments, board requests, county executive recommendation, and county council approval prior to board adoption and budget implementation. The timeline for the FY23 proposed budget is pictured on this slide. Today, we are at budget work session one with work session two scheduled for February the 8th in preparation for the Board of Education vote on February 22nd. Next slide, please. This evening's work session will focus on budget requests related to schools, labor relations, human resources, climate and school safety. At this time, I turn it over to Mr. Saris and Mr. Tantliff to re review the remaining slides. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Williams and Dr. Yarborough, and good evening, uh, Madam Chair and members of the board. Uh, Mr. Whit Tantliff, our uh, Director of Budget and Reporting, uh, will review with you uh, in this PowerPoint uh, the key uh, items uh, from the work session document that was provided uh, 
um, uh, a January, uh, well, I think the week before last, uh, January uh, 21st. Um, so Mr. Tantliff, uh, would you, uh, I, I think, uh, the, I think we need to get to that general fund revenue slide. slide. Um, Next slide, please. There we go. Uh, the general fund budget, which contains the majority of the day-to-day -day spending for schools and offices, including most salaries, is proposed at $1.86 billion for FY 2023, which is $178.4 million above FY 2022 and 20.9% above required local of maintenance of effort. The amount requested is 10.6% above FY22 spending. Next slide, please. The BCPS FY 2023 proposed budget for all funds, including general funds, special revenue, which is grant funds, capital projects, debt service and enterprise food service fund totals $2.43 billion, which is an increase of 115 million versus FY 2022. The FY23 proposed budget reflects a 5% increase in spending. Next slide. This slide summarizes the initiatives included in the proposed budget. The grand total of new initiatives includes 381.3 positions and $172.4 million. This evening's work session is focused on two key focus areas of the compass, high performing workforce and alignment of human capital, and safe and supportive environment. Next slide, please. Nothing is more important to a student's achievement than having a great teacher, administrator, and supporting staff. It addresses critical staffing, hiring, and retention issues we are encountering through increased targeted compensation. Next slide. As part of our process this year, School principals were surveyed to identify budget priorities that would positively impact Team BCPS. In the area of operating budget-based resources, principals indicated that a higher per pupil allocation was their top priority. Next slide. The top three school-based resources identified principals were additional teachers to reduce class size, staff development teachers for professional learning, and student support assistance as a new school-based support professional position focused on safe and supportive environments. Next slide. In the area of schools, the FY23 budget includes based per pupil funding, 5% increase over 22 or at $562,000, Start the moving cost of Red House run at a little over $400,000 in one-time expenses. Next slide. Uh, we'll now entertain uh, any questions on that section. Thank you, Mr. Taylor. Members, if you could indicate in the chat. Um, yes, Ms. Joes. Thank you, Mrs. Tancliffe. Uh, why is the capital budget fund down 37% on slide three? Um, the capital budget basically goes up in years where we issue debt and then it goes down in the off cycle years. That doesn't actually affect how we spend the money. Um, as the board um, has seen and approved the capital budget, um, that drives what the new projects are and of course we have our ongoing projects which we'll continue to spend so essentially that is new capital dollars that get infused into the process which um, those dollars often are um, spent over multiple years but it doesn't reflect a decrease in spending per se it's just uh, really reflects the issue and issuance of debt by the county all right thank you thank you mr kuhn Thank you, Ms. Hen. Good evening, Mr. Tantliff and Mr. Saris. Um, tonight, I'm going to focus some of my time 
on student enrollment. So I'm <coughs> going to draw your I'm going to draw your because all, most of our funding is based on per pupil. I think it's pretty important. So my first question has to do with uh, on page 18, the table that we have there that shows actuals all the way up to the projected um, number for this this coming year or fiscal year 23, which would be 22, 23. So my question to start off there is, you know, as I look across, I see growth of between 1,000, a little over 1,000, always less than 2,000. Um, and then we see a drop in 2021 of 3,000, almost 4,000 students. Um, and then our projected growth is basically picking up 3,000 students um, next year. What What is that based on? Could someone just explain that number to me? Um, well, I know the uh, the primary metrics and someone maybe more expert would need to jump in. We'll use Sage Consulting. Those are our primary consultants. They in a, in a typical year, and I know things are a little out of the ordinary because of COVID, but they'll look at um, building permits, new houses coming online, apartments coming online. Uh, they'll look at trends. They'll look at uh, young children that are not yet in pre-K or kindergarten, and they'll incorporate them into the projections. They'll use macro trends as well as micro trends. Um, but I know with COVID, um, things are a little more challenging, but I know they've still considered all of those things. And I believe they've probably also taken um, into account uh, the fact that we stayed in school so far all year, and hopefully that will attract some parents back into the system. Um, but to get more granular uh, than that, we'd need um, someone from uh, SAGE or someone from facilities who's been working on that project to, to um, add a little more detail. OK. Um, so I'm guessing we we probably don't have those people on this call to speak about the projection. So I'm just going to move on. Um, they they could speak at the next work session yeah, on that. OK, that's that's fair. Thank you. Um, I, I am concerned. I guess one of my questions is, right, we're budgeting at this target number. And. You know, we do the student counts in September. And then provide that to MDSE sometime in January, I think it becomes final. Um, so if we miss that number, where are where and when do budget impacts hit? So for instance, you know, this year was flat, right? We didn't we didn't jump yeah. up. We thought we were going to. So I think we have some grace this year. My question is this coming budget cycle, if if we don't increase, when do we when does the fiscal reality hit us that those 3,000 students aren't there and the funding that we asked for, and I'm guessing that is provided, what happens to that? Is there is there a, a point in time where that adjustment is made on the school system? Because it would be a massive impact missing sure. 3,000 students. Uh, sure, so um, I guess just to start uh, briefly from the beginning, our September 30th enrollment this year, so our September 30th, 2021 enrollment drives 100% of our funding in FY 2023. So our projections actually don't affect funding one way or the other. It just obviously affects um, how many teachers we think we need, how teachers get allocated to the classroom during staffing allocation and so forth. But this year's enrollment drives next year's revenue, both at the state and local level. OK, thank you. That's that's an important point of clarification to understand. Um, I appreciate that. Thank you. I'm just going to jump real quick because I know. We don't have a lot of time tonight. And I, I just want to just I'm sorry, one thing yeah. I'd mention is yeah. to, because across the state um, enrollment drops have been severe and they've not bounced back in this current year for next year. Um, we never know what will happen during the legislative session, but what's 
uh, been happening due to blueprint, they've let us use different years. Um, right for this year, it's a three year average enrollment that skips last year, um, which is driving our state and local revenue for next year. Last year, they basically had us match our 2019 enrollment. So they've taken that into account is just what I wanted to mention. OK, thank you. Now I'm going to jump to page 122. Please, your time is up. Oh, it is already? Yeah, Mr. Wow. Mercedes that was fast. Um, said you may not hear the timer. He needs to sign on him back in. So. All right, thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Mack, I believe you are next. Yes, thank you. Um, I strongly support asking for what is needed. However, since 2009, the highest percentage above MOE approved by the County Council was 5.6%. In this budget, we're requesting 20.9%. Will BCPS preserve people and pay for people um, should the BCPS FY 2023 budget request not be fully funded by our funding partners? Um, I guess uh, depending on how much funding we receive from the county, they would probably um, Put, they would probably identify things that they did and didn't want to fund. So I guess we would just have to see that situation. There, there wouldn't be um, a situation where we would lose, um, you know, be in a position where we're losing enrollment, I mean, um, positions, but we obviously wouldn't be able to fund everything that Dr. Williams proposed if all the funding is not provided. OK, thank you. Um, the January 7th vacancy report shows 308.3 teacher vacancies. Are all vacant teacher positions funded in this budget? Yes. Thank you. And then my next, there's a series of questions about paraeducators. Page 122 of the budget book shows 163.2 paraeducators broken down by elementary, middle, high school and other. The January 7th vacancy report shows 29.5 paraeducator vacancies. The executive summary indicates that 64 additional paraeducators are included. Page 170 shows an increase of 70 in the four bullets under salary highlights. And then during the budget meeting, we discussed the fact that 131.5 paraeducators were added through ESSER funds. And staff also stated that there are over 1,200 paraeducators in the system. I searched the entire budget and other than the 163.2 on page 122, I cannot find the term paraeducators. So where are they in the budget and how many total paraeducators will we have if this budget is fully funded? Um, I so don't. Let me jump in just briefly. Yeah. Um, I think uh, it's important to note that most of the paraeducators are in grants. And so um, if let's see here, if we look at the I'm trying to think, so I think you started on page 122. Yes. Mac with uh, the paraeducators of, of 150. Is that the one, line you were on? Total of 163.2, but the 150.2 right. is part of that. Right. So, so if you were to go to the very next page, which is uh, 123, that's the uh, special ed um, allocation page, and the the majority of our special uh, ed, of our para educators are in this. Uh, in the uh, special education grant. So I'm looking to see. Uh, and I don't see them broken. Um, you can out. see the third yeah. column, George, is FY23 proposed oh, Paris, which equals 708. Right. So there's the 708. And then the the bulk of the remainder are in the Title I grant. So that's going to take us uh to the back section of the book um and i'm trying to get there summer in 330 under the ida grant right so 
a lot of those um, support staff, the 163 uh, positions on page 330, as Mr. Tantliff said, are paraeducators. Um, and throughout uh, the other, some of the other grants, um, there are smaller uh, numbers of paraeducators, so they're not labeled as such uh, on every page, but uh, we do have a report that Mr. Tantliff's staff uh, produced that shows you the complete and exact breakout, which we can certainly provide. That would be helpful. And um, my next, actually, I lost my train of thought here. One second, please. If a grant expires, does that mean these positions go away? It means they can't be funded by the grant, uh, but the grant managers are usually looking ahead. So if, a, and that's usually smaller grants because our large grants like IDA and Title I, historically large, take, not taking into account ESSER and the COVID related grants, they continue from year to year. They some years get a little bigger, sometimes a little smaller, but those positions are preserved. Um, if a smaller grant is going away, uh, typically those are positions that are common throughout the system so they can be absorbed within um, other vacancies, but that uh, every case is unique and they need to look at that and, and plan ahead for when uh, a smaller grant does expire. So the 131.5 <clears throat> funded through ESSER funds um, will be in place through FY 2024, correct? Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rowe. Yes, thank you. So my first question is, I would like to understand, um, and I just want to clarify um, that I do understand this. So my understanding is that the school system operating budget is made up of 13 categories, and that within those 13 categories contain all the different line items, et cetera. And the, the board approves a dollar amount to each of 13 categories. And then the county executive goes through and does what he wants and sends it to the county council. And once they pass it, that is the um, approved budget. Um, and then the school system, once they get the budget back, am I correct that the school system can move money between the line items within each of those categories and does not have to ask for board approval until there's a transfer of money between those 13 categories in a bat transfer. Is that correct? Yes, but I mean, the intent is if if uh, an initiative is approved in the budget, we will fund and start up that initiative and, or hire, you know, create and hire those positions. OK, my next question is. I had spoken with someone earlier about special education, behavioral interventionists, and I would like to know how you calculate for the purposes of the budget, how many special educators and how many behavioral en interventionists each school gets, and um, exactly how that works because someone um, explained to me, and I'd like to know if this is true, that the special education enrollment September 30th numbers determine the staffing for special education in a school and that if they get more special education needs or IEPs, they don't necessarily get more staff or special education funding. And I'm wondering how we're compliant with FAPE if that's true. So could you please um, shed some light on the budgeting process and then how the money moves throughout the school year? for special education as increased special education needs happen in each school? Um, I, I guess I could start it and then, um, you know, maybe uh, Dr. Boswell McComas or someone from special ed can jump in, but um, we look at uh, total enrollment uh, this year to determine how much staffing we need for next year. 
Um, and I believe as much as they can, special ed would react to changes within the resources they have. Um, you know, if there was growth that they didn't expect at one school or one school is lower, they'll try to make adjust as adjustments as best they can within, you know, the head count that are approved for the year. So if a school finds that in the middle of the year they have more special education students or needs than they have staff, what do they do? Do they then go back to the special education office and ask for more resources and staff? Yes, um, good evening, Ms. Rowe. This is Dr. McComas. Um, thank you for the question. So uh, yes, we do uh, occasionally are able to support schools with expanded enrollment. Um, the other thing that's important to keep in mind that FAPE, uh, FAPE is not uh, necessarily based on a ratio. Um, it is based on the needs of an IEP, but I understand your point, certainly having adequate staffing to meet the needs of all the diverse IEPs. So I just wanted to clarify that, but we do uh, our best um, if schools uh, experience a great deal of enrollment to try to look at how we can supplement that staffing. And this Thank is you. George Saris. Uh, I'd just like to add that our, our students enroll continuously throughout the year, both regular and special ed students. So we've experienced years where we've had five and six and eight hundred students who weren't here on September 30, uh, the date upon which our funding is based. And we uh, we make these adjustments in our budgets uh, and in our planning. Uh, to the, with the resources we have to ensure the best possible circumstances for the students and uh, that we're serving. So it is a an, an ongoing constant process. Thank you, Ms. Rowe. Um, I have two questions and seeing no further board members questions in the chat, um, if you could <laughs> Put your questions if you have do have questions if you could please put them in the chat um mine too have to do with the principal survey could we display that slide once again if possible thank you on their budget priorities um the first i believe and it may have been the slide previously um was yes thank you the increase per pupil allocation how did we arrive at the five percent number is that something you could speak to? Um, I, I think we just felt like that was um, a substantial enough increase that the principals would feel it and they would feel a positive impact from that. OK, and that comes out to what, about 550 per? Yes. People? OK, which I know that the board had approved a substantially larger amount last year that was not um, approved by the county executive. Um, is that correct, Mr. Tantliff? That was reduced or eliminated? Um, it was, I, I just don't remember if that was last year or the year before, but yes, the large increase you proposed was uh, not funded by the county executive. Okay, is the, is the thought that we could gradually um, increase that, that we would start with 5% and work up? Because I know that that had been reduced over time um, when purchasing had been consolidated, I believe, for technology, copiers, things of that sort, that per pupil amount had been decreased. Well, I think we'd look at that each year. Uh, we, di we didn't conceive of a multi-year program to increase it year after year. But I think, uh, you know, we look at that each year and then the superintendent and the board can prioritize if they think more funding um, is needed. Because as you mentioned, because we centralized a lot of um, expenditures, so it, it didn't negatively impact in aggregate school spending, um, but, some, but it can be perceived that way. And because schools feel it unevenly, some may have lost some spending power. But I think we were really just uh, trying to to give them a shot in the arm, so to speak, for next year with the five percent. OK, thank you. Does the magnet allocation change um, in this budget? It does not. Or the same. It does not. OK. Well, but no. Yeah. 
the, the not magnet the people, not the first people. people. You didn't propose that. But um, Mr. Saris, there is a change in, in magnet well, allocation. The, the, what's going away is our $15 million magnet grant. So there are uh, significant funds, I want to say about 1.8 or 1.6 million that will uh, focus on more at the next uh, session. But those are, so that increases the general fund share of the magnet program in order to maintain the expansion that we undertook four years ago as part of the grant. Sure. So just to maintain it, we're taking sure. on a larger share of that. Great. Right. And and my um, last question is actually reflected on the, the next slide. I, I wanted to um, revisit the new position that was mentioned as a principal priority. You had mentioned a um, school safety based position and we, we kind of went through it quickly. So if you could repeat what that new position entails, I believe it was mentioned as a second priority as a school based resource. You can go back a slide. Back. You can go back again. You can go back to where the positions were listed on the survey. Back. Yeah, and then I think one more. Um, let me just get that page. I think uh, it was it was staff development teachers. Is that what you were looking for, Ms. Han? No, it was an, another position um, dedicated to school climate and safety, I believe you had mentioned. Uh, there was student support assistance as a new school based support professional position focused on safe and supportive environments. That's the one. <laughs> I wasn't sure what that that position entailed. Do you have any more uh, detail? The, there's not a specific position for that. I think there's just um, a number of the positions Dr. Williams has proposed um, are in that area of social worker, et cetera, that um, help promote a safe and supportive environment. Yeah, we'll get to those at, uh, towards the end of this presentation. Okay, fair enough. Thank you. And I believe um, Scott, uh, Ms. Causey, and then Ms. Scott. Question. Thank you, Jensen. Ms. Causey. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for this uh, presentation. Um, the first question I have is um, Public Works had uh, provided a report on September um, 14th of 2021. And what I'd like to understand is have all recommendations suggested for implementation in this year and fiscal year 23 been addressed in this budget? Um, I believe Dr. Williams at the uh, in conjunction with the January 11th presentation, um, he gave you an update um, for each board member on all of the different initiatives in the Public Works um, presentation or report. The only piece of that that's in the budget right now is the cabinet restructuring, and the re which is a savings of $1.7 million and nine um, FTEs. And the rest of the initiatives are uh, being evaluated. A number of them will be in FY 2024, and some will be implemented in FY 2023. Um, but there's not a large impact on the budget right now for those, but some could. But that, that piece of it's not finalized yet. What would be helpful uh, is to have the outline from Public Works with uh, the indication of which ones are included and which ones are not yet included on their implementation guideline. The uh, the cabinet restructuring and reduction of nine FTEs is the only piece of it that is in the FY 2023 proposed budget. 
just some clarity, there was an addendum shared with board members uh, regarding the efficiency um, report. And in that it went from chapter to chapter about FTEs. As you well know, the division work groups are looking at the efficiencies regarding operation, but the number of FTEs and um, this was included in the addendum that was um, shared with the board along with the board budget book. So there are some additional recommendations for this year and the following year. OK, so I think there needs to be more follow up on that um, and that can come in a weekly update or the next meeting agenda items. The next question is, um, we have a very uh, comprehensive and positive SRO program. Um, what, how are the SROs funded and what is the value in salary and benefits? Um, I don't have uh, the total uh, value of them off the top of my head. They're okay. funded by county government. They're not in our budget, so um, I think Dr. Zarchin might be able to add to this, but I know that uh, I, I want to say we have 74 or 75 SROs, all of which are provided by the county. OK, thank you. Um, the follow up to that is typically um, up to 70 officers have attended nationally recognized professional development each year at the National Association of SROs conference that's coming up in July. Is money from our current budget allocated for that? And is there money allocated for fiscal year 23 for that important training? And will it be used from this year to support their uh, trip in July? Um, I believe uh, I'm going to have to double check, but um, uh, you may recall Dr. Williams um, to fund the 1% call a, a year ago. Um, we reduced travel around uh, the organization and that included that bucket. Um, but I believe that they are looking at funding at least um, having that group attend remotely. Um, I don't know the exact plans off the top of my head for next year. And again, any follow up can be um, will okay. be appreciated in email or. <clears throat> the next question is student support networks, which started at Lock Raven High School to address poverty and homelessness um, has expanded greatly and they have submitted a request for funding. Uh, and I'm wondering where that is addressed or is it in the budget? Um, I could not locate it in the budget book. I'm not familiar with that. What was the program again, Ms. Causey? Student Support Network. They address the needs of uh, poverty and homelessness in Baltimore County Public Schools and the students that they impact. Yeah, I'm afraid I don't know either. I'm sorry. Ms. Causey, um, we are familiar with the network, but the request was not in time as you mentioned, wasn't in time for my presentation regarding the proposed budget for FY23. So I think if there's something that you want to share with the budget team, I think that will be helpful. OK, I'll be happy to send an email and we can address that further. The next question I had is it would be helpful to provide a outline of the budget requests and then what was implemented in this budget from our five area education advisory councils, the Special Education Citizen Advisory Council, the Gifted and Talented Citizens Advisory Council. Is that something that can be provided? Thank, thank you, Mrs. Causey. Um, go ahead, if you could answer Mrs. Causey and that's time, Mrs. Causey. Um. I, I don't know if that can directly uh, be answered. Uh, you know, they had all the advisory councils had general discussions. I don't know that they submitted specific requests. 
Dr. Williams, I think in general and staff heard uh, different conversations, but I don't know that there is a specific set of requests that they submitted that we would be able to, to address if those specific things are in the budget. Yeah, we don't, we've not historically received requests directly from these groups. We've ex, uh, received their, their areas of interest. Uh, they do uh, advise the board. So uh, if there are requests that have come through the board, then uh, those would be, uh, could be presented in the form of a motion to this, uh, to this process. Okay. Ms. Scott? Thank you. Um, my question is one that um, impacts all the students of BCPS, not just students that are served by an organization that only works with children in one part of the county. Um, what I wanted to know is the increase, and I believe it's on page 10 of the slide, if you could put that up, um, maintaining of one-to-one -one device ratios. It looks like uh, there was a um, decrease in device ratio cost, but an increase in funding for technology. And I'd like you to explain that um, it's on page 10, the one-to-one -one device ratio, because I know that this board has a directive to reduce the device ratio to five-to-one for, um, I believe it's elementary schools, but we're maintaining a one-to-one, -one, I believe, due to the pandemic. So while device costs went down, technology costs went up, and I, I wanted to see if you could speak to that um, a bit more. Um. Well, we are uh, scheduled to focus on technology as one of the planks in the next uh, work session. But um, what I'd say is our device costs and the switching of high school students to Chromebook have saved about $6 million. So uh, that offsets all of the proposed technology initiatives, but we wanted to show them um, broken out. But I think what you're ref referring to, um, I mean, it, it offsets the majority, not all of the new initiatives. Um, it, you may be uh, think, referring to, I'm not sure which document you were uh, referring to, Ms. Scott, but um, uh, one of the proposals is to have a lot more uh, technology technicians um, available to help support the schools because that's been um, a concern that's uh, been voiced uh, continuously, so uh, I believe that is one of the proposals. Okay, thank you for that, because I am aware that this board, when I first came, that was one of the main things this board voted. Um, I didn't vote in favor of it, but other members of this board voted to reduce the device ratio for elementary school students to five to one. And that has not been enacted only because of the pandemic. And when I look at the budget, it's one to one and I just want to make sure um, and maybe Dr. Williams could speak to this. Are we is the budget still working to maintain it at one to one devices for all students across all grade levels? So yes, Ms. Scott, um, as you recall, when we closed in March of 2020, um, we work with technology to try to get that ratio to 101 um, and there was the technology grant um, and the cares one grant so it is my goal to maintain that ratio and not to work backwards um, we found it very beneficial um, uh, as you saw for our students to have resources during the pandemic and when we all went virtual uh, it, it took a while to get to that point. Um, as you well know, there was every system probably in the country um, was ordering these these laptops or Chromebooks. And so, um, yes, um, there were some actions done prior to 2019 and because of the pandemic and due to the additional funding that we got from grants, we were able to purchase not only additional Chromebooks um, for students, but also for staff. And we had to do hotspots and all of those things for our students to be connected. Um, 
when we first closed due to the pandemic of March of 2020. So it's our goal to, to is to maintain that ratio, knowing that we are potentially growing. And as we grow in size, of course, there will be requests um, for additional uh, technology uh, and then also maintaining um, uh, surplus of replacing and restoring because in a, in a year, sometimes those laptops get, get a little beat up after a while, so. Thank you for that, Dr. Williams. Um, and I would just say that there is still a board directive out there. So you all are working and maintaining that in spite of the board directive. Do you have any so, further questions? Thank, excuse me, I, I'm still speaking. So thank you, Dr. Williams, for that explanation. But you, the system is doing that in spite of the board directive, which was to de reduce device ratios five to one for elementary school students, which, like you said, working backwards, not forwards. And I'm finished with my questions. Thank you. Thank you. And I see that Ms. Joes has a follow up followed by Ms. Pasture. Before we move on, Dr. Williams, could you please clarify for the board um, whether or not a vote or direct a motion on a given year's budget has any implication for future year's budgets outside of the year that a motion is made? Or perhaps is that a question for Mr. Bersades? In which case I will consult board counsel. Would you like me to restate my well, question? Well, the only thing I can say is the board supported the direction in which we were going in March of 2020 because we went all virtual and students needed to be connected with their teachers. And we use uh, obviously grant funds to purchase that, but um, that's what happened in 2020. I'll then pause for if Mr. Mercedes wants to respond to the question. Sure, and just to clarify, a motion made on a given year's budget is specific to that given year's budget. It has no um, action towards any future year's budget. And Mr. Bersades, is that correct? Can you weigh in on that, please? That, that, that's my understanding, Ms. Han. Thank you. So the board acted on the fiscal year 2019 budget and issued a directive specific to the fiscal year 2019 budget that is not a directive for any future year. Is that also correct? That's my understanding. So it's a moot point. Thank you very much. Um, Ms. Joes, you had a follow up and then Ms. Pasture. Yes, thank you. So to um, follow up in that, uh, it raises a question with me that if a board makes a motion or a directive to do something that has long term impacts, how could you say it does not impact future budget decisions? For instance, if we were to now, um, like for instance, the board pushed for device reduction ratio, you couldn't just go to the next budget and, and put in one to one ratio because it would be in place if people have made a policy change essentially. So I, I don't think it would move on from one to the other, but that is incorrect, that statement. Um, having worked on budgets, that is ac that is not accurate. So Mr. Sarris, is this a good time to ask about transportation questions or should I hold on to the next? Um, it's really scheduled for next time, but we're sort of jumping around, so I'm happy to answer a brief question if you have one. I, I could wait for the next session. Um, okay. No worries. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Pasture. Yes, thank you. Um, Mr. Saris, I just bring this up knowing it's coming up later because Ms. Causey asked about these two things um, which are of interest to me. One is about the SRO, but it does go back to the point that was made by the last two speakers because if I'm not mistaken, it was in 2019 that the national training was taken out um, on the county level. Um, and in light of so many recent things, uh, that national training does need to come back in. It's about $130,000 to send all of the SROs to that national training. So I know you're going to come to all of that later, but I just wanted to point um, that out for when you, you get there. 
that uh, that is in the thinking. And so I appreciate Dr. Williams comments about that. Also in terms of the student support network, uh, Dr. Williams, again, um, you pointed out that the request came after you had gotten into this and it's not about the organization. So Dr. Um, Mr. Saris, when you get to that point, it's not about the organization, it's about the funding and how we will be handling food services to our students. And there's um, quite a bit in the budget connected with that. The request had to do with making sure that we were spreading a wide net uh, for our students in terms of food. So um, I'm just trying to clarify on that, that it is about the services that we're giving to our students and not about an organization. And I think that was the intent of the organization is just to take a look to see that we were broadening our net. So when you get to that, just wanted that little clarification. Thank you. So that would be the CEP program, the latter it, point, or, it or could the well student be. support network. So yeah, it could well we know, be. Yeah. Yeah, it could well be. It could be. I'm looking right at the page pages now. So it could be because if CEP is doing that job or whatever else we're doing, then that's the bottom line that we are feeding our children and that we are making sure that. Um, those needs are accessible to our students. And so yes. I'll wait so, until you get to that. So thank you. Yeah, so this year, uh, the all students are eating free of charge. And uh, we have indications that uh, next year, the federal support for that program will go away. Uh, or, but, uh, but we are planning to use ESSER funds to keep that in place. So uh, for the for for this year and next year, uh, all students will be able to eat and we'll work with Dr. Williams on that student support network to identify uh, what uh, resources they might need in addition to our efforts. Thank you. And the same again about the SROs that it did stop after 2019. And so that does need to be looked at again. So sometimes what we do one year does have some impact, either knowingly or unknowingly, on years after that. So I'd appreciate it if we could look at that at the cost that I gave you, which I think is a pretty accurate cost at 130 thousand dollars for all of the SROs to go. That sounds about right and and we'll report back to Dr. Williams. I appreciate that. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Thank you. Um, is now a good time to ask about uh, like central office funding and um, and kind of programs in central office or would that be better for the next work session? Uh, that's well, not specifically yeah. targeted, so I, I think George probably fine either day. Yeah, let me. That's certainly fine. Let me just um, remind the board that we have two sections that are planned for tonight: um, staff relations, human resources, and climate and safety. So we're certainly available uh, for as long as as you are, uh, but for planning purposes, we may want to start moving on to the next three sections. OK, well, I'll just ask my question real quick yeah. then. Um, so one of the things that I've been talking to students about and, and it's a huge kind of conversation is kind of having a centralized support for student activities, extracurricular activities, student leadership opportunities. Um, Dr. Williams, I've talked to you about this um, a few times, kind of creating an office of student engagement with a director of student leadership and extracurricular activities. Um, so I don't know if you would have this available now, but uh, what would kind of an estimated cost be to create another uh, director position like that, maybe under the Deputy Superintendent. 
Uh, Mr. Thomas, I believe uh, staff is uh, is okay. putting that together right now, and it'll be available for the next work session. The all the questions you submitted. Okay, awesome. Well, then I'll just wait for until then. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. This is Kazi. Had you wanted to raise a point of order? You comment in the chat. Yep. Yes, Madam Chair. Go ahead. Um, Madam Chair, I appreciate your questions of clarification. Um, I believe per, per board policy and the handbook, it is not appropriate to assert uh, insubordination uh, in a meeting that that should be uh, done elsewhere. And I, for one, uh, believe as Dr. Williams has stated that he is operating within uh, and uh, with the support of the board in addressing the emergent needs of our students and staff that arose uh, dramatically uh, in March of 2020. So I just wanted to clarify that I, I believe Dr. Williams was operating uh, within your point of order? Uh, the appropriate point of order. What is your point of order? That's the comment. I'm not. What is your point of order? Mine? Yes. My point of order is decorum that we should all remember uh, the appropriate uh, ways to speak to and about each other. Are you making a point of decorum? Yes. And I'm glad that you clarified things to straighten that out. That's all. Thank you for raising it. I'm I'm going to continue. Um, please bring it to my attention if if it occurs again. Thank you, Mrs. Pauzy. Okay. Next, are there any further? Um, yes, Miss Scott, you had a comment. Yes, certainly. Thank you. Um, I, my comment is just that um, I understand. You said it was a mute point. Um, I don't feel that my question and concern in regards to our students and their technology and funding to ensure that they have the proper technology is a mute point. Um, I was just seeking clarification on that um, and the amount of money that was um, went towards technology. And I was citing that this board has voted um, for a five to one device ratio. That's not an opinion, that's a fact. And I just wanted to um, say that what we decide when we're voting on the budget and when amendments are made and um, motions are made and things like that, it does have an impact on our students. And I think that we need to be aware of that. And I just, you know, that was um, uh, something that was made, um, as you said, in the previous year, um, but it does still have an impact now. So thank you. Thank you. Board members, are there any further questions or comments? Uh, or discussion? Madam Mr. Chair, Madam Chair, uh, I'm yes. reading stuff in the in the chat, which is bothering me. I think we need to move forward. The team has taken the budget book and chunk it just to get through the section and to entertain questions. If they can't answer it today, they will take the question and get the specific responses to then move forward, um, potentially having a, an answer next week. I'm, I'm just watching our time and I'm a little concerned about what's going on. Um, I just think my suggestion is if we can move on to the next section, like Ms. Pastor raised a question about safety, that could be raised at the next section, I believe is coming up. Um, that's just my request at this time, just monitoring our time. I, and I believe we are wrapping up. I thank you for raising that concern. Um, Mr. Thomas, do you have a question for this section or are you comfortable I, with proceeding? Well, it, it, there was a statement that Mr. Saris made that I just want a clarification on. Um, it was okay. not related to this section though. Okay, can you hold that for the next section and we will proceed and you will be first for the next section or would you like to gain clarification and can you do so briefly? Yeah, I, I, I can do so briefly. Just a quick clarification. Um, you mentioned that ESSER funds for uh, the school lunches would continue for this budget. 
but is the plan for future budgets to also to then transition into the general fund for offering free lunches for students or has that not been discussed yet? Uh, we have raised it in the past with county government and I think when the grant expires, uh, it will remain at the forefront of those discussions. And so, um, and, and it really just stems from the the embrace of the CEP program uh, and its ability and our ability to fund it within the current fee structure and the amount of cash available and for how long we can do that. So yeah, that will continue to be a discussion every year with every budget um, so that we can, can keep the program in place one way or another. Thank you so much. It's great to hear. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so that concludes this section. Um, Dr. Williams, I believe we're ready to proceed. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Thank uh, you. And there's three sections. If it's okay, I'll go. Uh, there's a question break between them, but why don't I just go through all the slides and then you can ask questions on all three sections in the interest of time. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chandler. Uh, for staff relations, the FY23 proposed budget includes employee incentives and uh, salary st structure restructuring um, of 28.5 million, employee compensation steps of 18.1 million, and cost of living adjustments totaling $52 million. Next slide, please. Next slide. Um, in human resources, the budget uh, includes staffing, and this is on top of the teachers that'll go in the school of 34.3 FTEs. Watershed Charter uh, will increase their staffing by one FTE. Um, we've, re uh, Dr. Williams requested 12 assistant principals and support staff, totaling $915,000. 22 staff development teachers, totaling $1.2 million a salary step for the executive director in chiefs and a director salary scale adjustment of $257,000 and uh, blueprint driven increases in the na teacher national certification program of $596,000. Next slide, please. Um, human resources also includes um, Kelly services to manage the substitute hiring process for $3.4 million. Um, there's a cabinet restructuring, which we've already discussed today, which is a reduction of nine FTEs and $1.7 million. Extended day support, um, which supports the extra 15 minutes in the day with um, long-term subs and lunchroom assistance, $3.4 million. Uh, increase of substitute and miscellaneous pay of just about $3 million. Mandatory minimum wage increases of $1.3 million. Um, and then fringe benefits associated with the new um, positions that Dr. Williams has proposed of just about $16 million and employee fringe benefits for existing employees, which is uh, a little under $900,000. Next slide, please. Next slide. Um, and in uh, the last section, safe and supportive environment, BCPS is taking a comprehensive approach in addressing the social and emotional well-being of our students, and the FY 2023 budget reflects that. Next slide. Um, also in the principal budget survey, the top three centralized resources identified by principals to support a safe and supportive school operations were school workers, psychologists, and centralized resource teachers. Next slide. Um, under climate and school safety, significant resources are proposed to support students impacted emotionally by the pandemic, including 33 school counselors, 22 health assistants and two health supervisors, one fiscal assistant for psych services, 10 social workers, and one social worker supervisor. And next slide. That concludes um, the presentation that we had for today. Thank you. Questions for members? Ms. Rowe? Yes, can you tell me how many behavioral interventionists are in our school system right now and do all of our Title I schools 
um, or low poverty schools have behavioral interventionists? And are we adding any of those? Um, I don't know the total of behavioral interventionists in the system right now. Could I get that in an email? Yes, we can provide that to Dr. Williams. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mack. Yes, um, Mr. Tantler, have you talked about $596,000 for the teacher national certification? How did yeah. you arrive at that number? I believe in a previous meeting, maybe the budget meeting, I asked how many teachers achieved the national certification and I thought the answer was 10 at most. Um, can you just explain sure. how we achieved, how we got to the 596? Sure, under Blueprint, um, nationally board certified teachers get $10,000. And if they're in low performing schools, and low performing schools is still under a process of being defined in conjunction with MSDE, teachers get $17,000. Um, we had, I believe, I don't have it right in front of me, but I think we had 48, so that number 10 is not familiar to me. We had 48 um, uh, under the NBC and another 17, uh, I think it was 18, and what we tentatively thought were in low performing schools, but that number could change once low performing schools are finally uh, defined. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Ms. Rowe, did you have a follow-up question? No, not at this time. Okay, thank you. Other questions, comments, board members? Mr. Thomas? Thank you. So my first question is um, on page 121 of the Board Operating Budget Book, uh, it says that we have one school counselor per every elementary school and one per every 350 students for middle schools and high school. My question is why this ratio, one to 350 for high school and middle school? Um, Dr. Zarchin may have uh, more to add, but um, I think over time, that was based on the staffing we had available. We thought that was an acceptable ratio, but I believe over the next several years, we're trying to improve that ratio to get uh, closer to the national standard. That's right. correct. Is, and the national standard is one to 250. Uh, that ratio we hope to be uh, meet that in three years. Thank you. Is this the first of those three years? I believe so, yes. 23, thank you. yes. Thank you. Um, will all 20, will all high schools in BCPS have access to a full-time college and career readiness counselor with these new FTEs? I don't yes, know that's the goal. Oh. So it would be 10 and a half additional career counselors to meet that goal for one for every high school. Okay, but they wouldn't be full-time. They would be only A day or B days, right? No, I believe it would be full time. And just to to make certain, I'd like to uh, invite Ms. Ferguson in to speak to specifics there. Hi, good evening. Um, yes, Mr. Thomas, the addition of the 10.5 FTEs would would make the college counselors full time. So right now they're half time. When we add 10.5 FTEs, that would make every college counselor in the high schools full time. That is so exciting to hear. Um, thank you so much. Uh, on page 199 of the budget book, it says that there will be 102.3 psychologist FTEs. Now, will that mean that every BCPS school has access to at least one? Good evening again. So every every BCPS school has access to a school psychologist. Um, that school psychologist may not be full time at that school, but they every school does have access to a school psychologist. Thank you. And what's the ratio for school psychologists to students in middle school and high school? I don't have that number right now. I can get that for you. OK, that would be helpful. Thank you. And those are, are my questions.
Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Mrs. Causey? Thank you, Madam Chair. The, um, what's up here? So on, excuse me, on page, uh, excuse me, slide 25 from the superintendent's presentation on the proposed budget indicates a decrease in special education enrollment from fiscal year 20 high of 16,081 special education students to the latest number of 14,924, uh, which is a decrease in 1,157. Since educators and special educators did not have face-to-face -face access to evaluate a student's need for special education services during the pandemic and testing was essentially um, put on hold, how accurate is that 14,924 special education enrollment number? Um, well, I believe it's as accurate as we had the ability. Um, you know, it was this school year. That's where that number is coming from. So, you know, every student that has an IEP, um, it, could some have been missed because of the pandemic? Um, I, I can't really speak to that, but the number uh, I believe is fairly accurate. Well, it's as accurate as we could make it. So what was the date for which it comes? So, uh, special Ed's October 1st, 2000, okay. so 2021, October 1st. It's a different day than the general ed enrollment, which is September 30th. Okay, thank you for that. And so there are potentially students identified as needing special ed services um, since the beginning of school. Is there a way to understand what the current number is? Um, we, we could tell you what you mean as of today, how many children are considered special education? Um, uh, yes. If that's your question, that that number would be available and could be provided. Thank you. Um, and on page 120 of the budget book, uh, it highlights an increase of 75 special education IEP chair teacher FTEs to be converted from the ESSER grant. Um, I have three questions. Are these new positions since they carry the title of teacher? Uh, will these positions pull students for services? And will these IEP chair FTEs be a teacher of record, which a classroom teacher, um, even part time? Um, so the 75 IEP chairs are in the ESSER grant this year. Um, and the intent, and it's for elementary school, and they're incremental positions that are just focused on being an IEP chair. I don't believe that they're doing any classroom teaching. Um, and the intent was to move them off the grant if the funding comes through and move them into the general fund, which would free up additional funds on the ESSER grant. Um, so it would be the same initiative that exists this year. It would just move to the general fund. Okay, thank you. So those 75 positions, are those different than the 215.3 um, FTEs? Are they in addition to or are they part of the two addition to they're in addition to okay in the 215 uh, can you advise which of those positions will be permanently dedicated to individual schools well um just about all those positions will be assigned to schools i, I don't know if i fully understand the question miss causey will be permanently dedicated to individual schools. Sometimes we've had um, administrative support staff that are assigned to two or more schools. Um, I, I don't know how many will be split between schools or will be just in one school. And that may not be probably known how those positions be used fully until next year when we saw see the final student lineup for the year. OK, and it would be helpful, I believe, to have the students identified um, as needing special education services that were removed by their parents uh, during the pandemic. And if any of them have returned, um, because we do have transfer codes for each student coming into and out of the system. Uh, Ms. Clausey, I'm sorry, one uh, correction. The, the IEP chairs are part of the 210. They're not, they're not an addition. 
I believe that's time, Mrs. Causey. Okay, and Joe's. Um, my last question is on the record. Joe's. Joe's. That's time, Mrs. Causey. Uh, point of order. That's time. Ms. Joe's. Thank you. Um, Mrs. Sarah's, um, you had talked about psychologists and we don't have many psychologists. Do they move between middle elementary school and high school or are they assigned um, middle schools and, and high schools? And secondly, I saw there was a mandatory minimum wage increase of $1.29 million across the board. Does that include part-time employees as well? So, uh, the, yeah, go ahead, Lynn. Oh, I was just saying the, the minimum wage includes everyone who's being paid an hourly wage that was below uh, it would be 12 50. It just went to 12 50 on January 1st. And so the budget includes that for half a year and then 13 25, which will be January 1st, 2023. So uh, a lot of hourly employees, but uh, anyone on any scale who has an hourly wage below minimum that will bring them up. And the, the psychologists are assigned uh, to groups of students at at a certain level. So uh, they're going to serve typically more than one school. And I think Ms. Ferguson can offer any more detail on that. Good evening. The question was that um, whether or not the school psychologists cross grade levels and yes, they do. So there, a school psychologist could serve an elementary school and a middle school or a high school and a middle school. OK, thank you. Um, one other question, the, uh, Dr. Williams, this may be to you for the 15 minute uh, increase in the school day. How is that, that going to be sustained? Is that something we would be considering? So thank you, Ms. Joe. So currently um, that is being funded through uh, ESSER funds. And at some point I will be making the request for it to be a part of our operating budget. And with or, or George Sarris, would you just say what, what year that is? We have it funded in 22, three and four through ESSER. So FY25, we would need to thank request so general fund. FY25, FY25, Ms. Joe's. So, Dr. Williams, what services or pos positions are projected to be dropped if those funds are not included in the general fund once those grant funds expire? Well, that's my work when it comes to that point. Um, hopefully nothing will be dropped, but that would be the work um, that I would move put forward and the work that we would do with the county, with the county government. Um, um, the county executive does know that we're using ESSER funds to fund the 15 minutes, um, but that's the planning as Mr. Uh, Tentliff mentioned about how we looked at the grants over multiple years. Um, that is a substantial amount of money, but at this point, I don't know what will be dropped. Um, I'm hoping nothing will be dropped, but um, those are the conversations that we'll have to have. We have to continue to fund that, that additional 15 minutes. So uh, to follow up, Mr. Kuhn just put in the chat $30 million for 15 minutes at FY 23 and 24, and that is coming through grants. My concern is how that's going to be sustained in the future years. And if we increase a 15 minutes, then you can't really go back and then decrease 15 minutes in school time. I mean, you could, but it's again an impact on future budgets. That is correct and 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 those are the conversations we'll be having as we present and develop the budget uh, for future years. And to your point, um, we knew that we had to put in those 15 minutes for this year based on what was happening last year. And remember the state was always on Baltimore County to really get our student hours um, up to these additional 15 minutes. So uh, we were we were dealing with two different things. One was about the needs of our students and satisfying the MSDE requirements. And so to your point, duly noted that we will be looking at future budgets and figuring out how we can sustain the additional 15 minutes within our operating budget. 
Thank you, Dr. Williams. So that proves my point that future budgets are impacted by what happens in this budget and you have to carry it over. Um, so hopefully we will be able to sustain the 15 minutes. Thank you, Mr. Tancliffe as well. Sure. Thank you, Ms. Doe's. Mr. Offerman? Yes, uh, my question concerns uh, to the, and this is really about now as, uh, as well as this, uh, as well as the, uh, the coming year's budget. Uh, are we contracting out to uh, private, uh, private, uh, excuse me, are you contracting out to private psychologists, any, uh, any of the, pro any, any of the needs that, that we have that our, that our, uh, that our current staff is, uh, is uh, unable to meet at this time? Ms. Ferguson, did you want to address that? Um, yes, good evening again. So we contract out for um, assessments, um, not for actual <clears throat> student services or direct student support, but for assessments only. Okay. And with this increase, assuming that we that we in fact get get this increase to uh, approve and we'll carry it through, will that will that uh, will that uh, minimize the uh, the uh, the need for uh, for using uh, outside resources, or or do we still do we still plan to continue to uh, to uh, to uh, to do that in, in in the future? Well, I believe the the budget item is in reference to um, an FTE, and that FTE is related to a fiscal assistant to manage some of the work um, that comes out of that yeah. office. So it's not necessarily this particular budget item is not. Um, related to student assessments. That, that, thank you. That's why. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Offerman, uh, this is George Saris. We do also have a, uh, a supplemental state trauma and behavioral health grant that's focused on providing services during the summer. Um, and, and some of those services, uh, I believe, are contracted out because we don't have full-time folks that are available throughout that summer period. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Offerman. Mr. Kuhn? Thank you. Um, I wanted to follow on, I, I know in our budget committee meeting in, on January 5th, we talked at length about the ESSER projections. Um, and Ms. Jose pointed out the fact that we're running into a fiscal cliff with this $30 million spend year after year, uh, and we're using grant funds uh, to move that into the future. Um, but I also wanna point out that there's a significant number of people that we're paying for with the ESSER funds. And um, as I look at, at some of this information, it looks as if we have, you know, $30 million for the 15 minutes, and then a significant number of, of people, uh, totaling close to 400 people mm -hmm. that are being paid for through these ESSER grants. Um, and that's a significant amount of money. I guess my question to um, Dr. Williams, uh, Mr. Tantliff, and Mr. Saris is, as we work through 23, and we're still using the ESSER funds, and 24, some of them start to, to move around a little bit, is the expectation that um, the blueprint money is going to come in and increase our budget in ways to lessen the impact and perhaps dampen um, what looks like a tremendous cliff uh, to, to myself and other board members. Um, I can start. Uh, so certainly blueprint funding um, over the coming decade will uh, increase and will help support some of those functions. Um, I think some of the initiatives, uh, it, it may just turn out that uh, they fulfilled the intent of the grant, which was to stem and address learning loss associated with the pandemic. So some of the positions may just be absorbed into vacancies in the future um, if they can't be funded 
But, uh, you know, I think it's sort of like what Dr. Williams was saying before, it will, will, it'll come down to priorities and how much funding is available and then making those choices. And there may be some things that can't be funded, in, in which case those positions would be um, absorbed into existing vacancies. Yes, and, and in developing the grant applications, uh, we specifically worked with uh, the Division of Human Resources in identifying positions for which we have ongoing needs in the general fund uh, because our, our practice has always been, we've always been able to uh, maintain uh, individuals in comparable positions as they move off and on to grants. And I think one of the initiatives Dr. Williams was very clear about putting in this budget were those 75 IEP chairs because it, it recognizes the fact that here is something that will have to be moved and let's start somewhere. And that's where we've started for FY23. Um, not to lose sight of, of this issue. Um, and hopefully some, uh, you know, some programs that require lots of staff like virtual learning and, uh, and some of the support positions might not be as, uh, as much of a priority in 2025. It would be nice to think that we might uh, return to yesteryear, but um, it's really unknown yet. Well, thank you, Mr. Saris, because you've you've led directly into my next question, which is about the virtual academy, because I see no funding beyond 2023 projected with ESSER funds. Is the expectation that the virtual academy goes away? So Not, the virtual yeah. academy, let me respond to that. The virtual learning program was in response to the pandemic. And right. those who were hired knew that it was pertaining to the pandemic. And any given year, we have this attrition, we have folks who retire, leave, and we hire. So of course, um, those individuals who are part of the, of the grant um, each year may have an option to move from that grant into a sitting vacancy. Um, but the original thought was looking at the virtual learning program out of the response of the pandemic. Now, there are, we've always had a virtual learning component uh, where students were able to take classes. The decision that needs to be made, do we want to continue and make it much more re robust? Do we want to continue what we currently have? Do we want to move in a new, in a new direction with virtual learning. And so um, you're correct. When we decided to use ESSER funds was just, and it fit, it fit the criteria to really address what we did know or knew with the pandemic a year ago to, to, to help meet the needs. The question now, as we um, move closer to the end of the, of the um, end of the grant, what are we going to continue with the virtual learning program? No decisions have, have been made uh, about that, Mr. Kuhn. Um, uh, we are really looking at our data in the program now, uh, something that uh, we just had some preliminary conversations this week about the future of virtual learning uh, after the three, one, two, the three years. Um, but right now, no final decision. Well, thank you, because um you know, the money was specific for the pandemic and it definitely fits the bill for this grant. So I fully agree with that and I appreciate your, your explanation. Thank you. I, I do want to comment that there, there are needs and desires for our community for us to expand our virtual learning. Um, so I just want to reference that as well. What it will look like, give us some time to work through the logistics, but uh, there are some needs out there uh, and I think actually one board member said we should look at our virtual learning and have this K to 12. Maybe it was just in, in a 
informal conversation. But again, the, the system has not really discussed all the details to figure out what will happen when the grant funds run out for virtual learning. But we're having those conversations now. The team has had some interest to explore expanding and um, that's something that we just have to have more conversations regarding. Thank you for your question. Thanks. Thank you. Mr. Thomas. Thank you. Dr. Williams, uh, when do those grant funds run out for the virtual learning program? The eligibility term extends through September 30 of 2024. That's the, the, the entire grant can be used until that point. OK, thank you. Uh, so some of the questions I have um, on page two or three of the budget and in this PowerPoint, it says that there are 137.7 FDEs for social workers. Um, I was wondering, is there a national ratio standard that social workers you know, should have in comparison to students? Um, is there one? Yes, um, Ms. Ferguson or Dr. Zarchin. I don't have that number right now, but I'll certainly get that to you. OK, and you I, you don't have the numbers. So I don't know if you'll be able to answer this, but are we meeting that national standard or is it, are, are we moving towards a national standard with these 10 new FTEs? Um, I'll have to look at the current okay. numbers and um, the the national standards and um, get a, a response back to you. OK, that's perfect. And Mr. Thomas, if I remind you to my presentation, the whole goal okay was to provide additional support for our students. And that's why we were looking at additional counselors and I provided the ratio for counselors. I don't think I did for social workers, but we know how important the roles of our social workers, PPW, psychologists. And so that was the whole point to make sure we are supporting our students in our schools. OK, thank you. Um, and wow. with these 137.7 FTEs, well, Sue, Every school, have, I'm assuming all schools will have access to at least one social worker if they're part time. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. OK, thank you. Um, on page 120, uh, it discusses the 40 new ESOL teacher FTEs. I was, it says that we will be maintaining a 50 to 1 ratio. And I was wondering, the 51 the ratio, I mean, I'm not an ESOL teacher. I was just wondering, is that kind of the what the ratio should be 50 to 1? Or are we going to be moving towards in future budgets 45 to 1, 40 to 1? Or is that kind of like the how ESOL teachers can function with the 50 to 1 ratio? Um, so the goal is we had a huge increase in our ESOL yeah. and we have to provide the services. So the goal is that to hire enough staff to meet the needs of our students who need ESOL services. Um, we will be happy to follow up if there's a national standard um or ratio but what we currently have is is not enough to meet the needs of what's happening in our schools and that's why we're having the 40 new FTEs yes okay All right. yes thank you thank you so much okay thank you Mr Thomas um seeing that there are no further board member questions in the chat Madam uh, Chair yes mm -hmm. I'm sorry, Ms. Rowe, I did say I would come back to you. You wanted to be last. Go ahead, Ms. Rowe. So page, then, 200, page 200 shows only a 0.6 FTE increase in pupil personnel workers and a one FTE decrease of support staff in the same department for a total PP, um, PPW FTE of 49.8 and support staff FTEs of 16. In 2019 pre-pandemic, BCPS had a chronic absenteeism rate of 21.5% and 16.2% of its students missed greater than 20 days that year. And during the first year of the pandemic, we know that 4,000 students accessed no learning at all. How can we expect fewer than 50 PPWs to meet the needs of over 108,000 students? I think that's a, a question that school climate safety and possibly Ms. Ferguson would have to address in light of whatever our current absentee issues are post or 
during the pandemic versus beforehand. But I can share that our PPWs are instrumental in, in working with families when there are attendance issues, but they are not alone. Uh, they're also supported by teams in schools and other personnel to make connections um, beyond the classroom teacher and, and to try to turn that trend uh, back to school attendance at much higher levels. So when a student moves from one house to another house, and they're waiting for two months for mail to come so they can enroll in their new school, as I've seen happen frequently in my neighborhood. It is the PPW who comes out to the house to help that student enroll without the required pieces of mail. And I've seen kids in my neighborhood wait weeks for that PPW to be available. So that student is missing two months of school while they wait for mail. How can we help that not to happen anymore if we don't have enough PPWs? So I, I, again, I, it, the PPWs are certainly the ones that go to the homes, uh, but but it's not just about the PPW. It is a team uh, who identifies when there's a concern, uh, right down to the attendance secretary or front office staff, uh, classroom teachers. Uh, that's the work that needs to be done to, to cut that time down. So is there data on recommendations about how many PPWs a school system should have per students? Is there any best practices out there regarding that number? We can provide that for you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. O. Ms. Mack? Yes, I had a quick follow-up question to Mr. Thomas. Um, on page 130 of the proposed budget um, and then page 122, I'm sorry, 122 in the proposed budget and on page 130 in the adopted FY22 budget, there are a number of ESOL teachers identified as others, even though we have them broken down as elementary, middle, and high school. In the proposed budget, there is 103. Last budget, there were 63. Um, how, why are they broken out as other? Why are they not assigned to schools? And how are they used? Um, I don't know off the top of my head. We'll have to get back to you on that. We can actually follow up, Ms. Mack, about how our ESOL population is used. I'm not seeing where you're describing the, cate the, the category, but we'll definitely we'll be able to report back how our ESOL. You remember um, ESOL, is, our staff is working with students who are identified as English language learners. Um, and so the whole concept about learning literacy, um, but in terms of the category, the, the staff will have to follow up as to what does that mean about other? Wherever. Thank you, Dr. Williams. And yeah. just so the line is 62 for elementary, 13.5 for middle, 34 for high, and 103 for other for a total of 212.5. And I think some of that uh, is due to the fact that we have a current model that involves regional or, or localized centers for these programs. Um, and so. Uh, we'll follow uh, up, George. Yeah. We'll follow up because to that point, this is level, this is divided by level. We'll follow up about the 103. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, Ms. Jones, did you have a question for Mr. Mercedes? <clears throat> yes, Mr. Mercedes, I, I know we've been um, told several times not to conduct business in the sidebar, so it's chat. Is it appropriate to ask questions on the um, chat, and does that violate Open Meetings Act? I, I would need a specific uh, example, Ms. Jones. There is a question asked uh, after Ms. Causey's time is up, and um, it's it seems that that should be asked and open. So I, I'm, if you can read that, is that my concern is that I've always been told not to do those side businesses in the chat, and is that a violation of Open Meetings Act? 
Generally speaking, just, there should not be side conversations in chat. So, OK, so that would classify as a side conversation. Is that correct? I, I think we're. This, this isn't a uh, Robert's rules uh, point of clarification. Uh, however, what I appear to see from Ms. Causey is uh, reiterating a question that she asked during her time. So that that's what I see, and that doesn't I, that does not strike me as inappropriate. So I will respond. Board members, I'd ask you, um, if at all possible, to refrain from using the chat to have discussions and to ask for acknowledgement from the chair if you have a comment or concern to raise a point of order. Thank you, Ms. Joes. Um, Thank you, Ms. Hen. Mr. Brusades, but that would be subject to PIA, right? The chat on the sidebar. So that would be an OMA violation, but you are the lawyer, so thank you. Ms. Scott? Or, um, I'm sorry, Mrs. Causey and then Ms. Scott. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I appreciate Mr. Brusades uh, actually reading my comment, which uh, starts off with, in case you missed it. Ms. Causey, Ms. So Causey, it not was any reiteration, it was not. So not what? Discuss. This is Mrs. Ms. Joe's raised a point of order, which I acknowledge. We're not going to have extended discussion on this. If you have a question regarding the presentation in the budget that is on topic, I will acknowledge that. Otherwise, we need to continue and wrap up our questions on the budget. This is a topic for um, another agenda item, but it's not budget related. So I ask board members not to engage in chat in the um, chat, engage in conversation in the chat. I'm not honoring any other discussion on this as it's off topic. Madam Chair, I am calling a point of order for decorum. And I'm not. It is I'm not appropriate not, for board members to assert things I'm, that the Madam, board attorney has stated are not an issue. I'm I'm not I'm not honoring your point of order. If you'd like to challenge that, you may call a vote, but I'm not acknowledging that. Now that is a, a, a topic of discussion for another session, but not not now. Do you have a question around the budget? Madam Chair, I would like the board attorney to clarify again what he stated before. Madam Chair, the, uh, Mrs. Causey, the board attorney has spoken on this matter. Do you have a question on the budget? I do. On page 25 and page 137 and page 207, there are uh, table uh, organization charts. Uh, uh, none of those reflect the current organization of uh, the school system. So I wanted to know if uh, those are going to be updated um, to reflect the current organization. Um, Ms. Kowalski, I believe the plan is in the adopted budget book to update all the organizations. My understanding is when the board votes on the budget, they, they are voting on the entire book so that if we have a concern with um, accuracy or completeness in the book that the book should be correct. Uh, well, what you're referring to though is just moving reporting structures. It's not uh, anything financial or number of positions impacted. Actually, it is number of positions and finances because there's elimination of positions. Those are already those, those are already reflected in the book, the nine positions and the one point seven million dollars. I uh, but they are not reflected on these three pages and there may be additional pages that are incorrect, so I would request that they be corrected before the board votes on them. Madam Chair, if Ms. Causey has a specific position that she's referring to, I would appreciate her sending that email to yes. us. As, as Mr. Tanliff explained, um, this is showing where we are at this point, um, and there will be some modified organizational charts um, coming forward. Um, it was it. I'll just leave it at that. Thank you. 
Mrs. Cosby, if you could put that in writing um, an email to Dr. Williams and myself, please. Certainly, thank you. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Scott, please go ahead with your question. Uh, yes, I wanted to confirm um, the presentations that were um, presented from the system. Was this the last presentation? No, in the, in the next work session, we were planning to go through all of curriculum instruction. Um, we were planning to go through facilities, transportation, and information technology. Okay, but th is this the final for tonight? Yes, yes, that was the yes, Ms. Scott. We we broke up the the budget book like we did last year, um, so we're done with tonight's presentation. Yes. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, <clears throat> hearing that, then I call for orders of the day. Okay. Um, Ms. Scott, thank you. So it is. This is the last agenda item prior to announcements, which are scheduled at 8 p.m. I believe there were no further questions um, beyond Mr. Thomas just had indicated one in, in the chat. Um, Mr. Bersades, orders of the day require two third vote and there's no, um, it's non-debatable, is that correct? It's non-debatable, does not require a second, and would take two-thirds to uh, sure. overturn. To overturn. Yeah, I believe it requires seven, um, considering our, our numbers. It re requires two-thirds to overturn it. Overturn. Correct. Okay. That so absent absent that we would go to the next uh, item on the agenda. Okay. The next Madam chair, I move to overturn orders of the day. This is Miss Causey. Is there a second? Second row. Thank you, Miss Rowe. Miss Causey, do you want to speak to your motion? I would like to uh, hear the student members' question. Um, I believe uh, something of this magnitude, we should discuss it uh, in, <clears throat> if board members have additional questions. Also, I, can can legal, can Mr. Brusades clarify the number of votes needed to overturn? Two thirds, so that would be eight votes. Okay, thank you. Unless Mr. Brusades, since the, can the student member vote on this item since we're discussing the budget? It's a parliamentary issue, not a, a budget issue. Just, so yes, the student member can vote. Thank you for that clarification. So eight votes would then be required um, to overturn orders of the day. Any other comments or discussion before we call a roll call vote? Um, Ms. Hen, I just have a, a question. So just so I'm, I'm clear. Uh, Mr. Kuhn, yes. Um, what we're trying to do is basically end discussion on the budget and move into information and end the meeting, correct? Correct. Ms. Scott called orders of the day, which would end the budget discussion and go to the last or the next item on the agenda, which is the last item, which is announcements, which then um, we would then adjourn the meeting. So Ms. Causey's motion is to overturn orders of the day, which would continue on the um, the work continue the work session. All right, thank you. We're now voting to or discussing vote before we vote on overturning orders of the day. Any Ms. other? Um, Any I, I just would ask, is it appropriate? Excuse me, Madam Chair. I'm sorry. That's okay, Miss Scott. Thank you. Um, I I didn't want to speak without being recognized. Um, is it appropriate for me to speak to my? motion or rather orders of the day or because I know it's a privileged motion. I don't want to speak out of turn. Would you like to speak to the motion to overturn orders of the day? No. Well, no, I want to speak to my motion to <clears throat> suggest orders of the day, but if it's out of order, I won't. It's I think it's relevant because we're speaking in general to orders of the day. So if you'd like to speak to it, um, feel free to go ahead. Certainly, yes, I, I feel that it's appropriate. We've had discussion 
Um, we have our, our, our budget committee where we discuss the budget. We had discussion here. I think that we've um, gone over that. And so I feel that um, it is appropriate um, for orders of the day. So that was why I made the motion. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Mr. Thomas. Thank you. I, I was just going to um, say that. So I, I don't believe that we should call it today, but I'm probably going to vote. I'm not going to vote to overturn it. My question was a simple question about the third session of this meeting, and I'm just going to send it to email um, to Dr. Williams. You know, it's, it's late, so that's just what I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I will just add briefly that I think we were there <laughs> already, so I am not going to support this motion, but I, I think we were already there anyway. So um, at orders of the day in that we were at the end of our questions. So I, I don't think we need to to continue. I think we were in the process of wrapping up. We have additional um, oh, an additional work session and the vote scheduled, which provide opportunities for follow up questions. So I will um, not be supporting this motion for that reason. OK, any other comments or questions for members before we call the vote? OK, Ms. Gover. Ms. Rao. No. Ms. Fozzi. Yes. Ms. Mack. No. Mr. McMillian. No. Ms. Jose. No. Ms. Pasture. No. Mr. Thomas. No. Mr. Offerman. No. Ms. Scott. No. Mr. Kuhn. No. Ms. Hen. No. So the motion is out. Thank you, Ms. Cover. The motion fails. The last item on the agenda is announcements. The board's next meeting will be held on Tuesday, February 8th, 2022 at 630 p.m. Thank you all for joining us tonight. The meeting is now adjourned. Have a good night, everyone. Good night, everyone. Good night. You too. Good night. Good, good night. night.